start the recording. All right, hello and welcome to this webinar training. I'm super excited about this one. I'm joined by my good friend, Julie Eason. She's from nonfictionbookacademy.com. You can check that out at nonfictionbookacademy.com forward slash sales. Julie is an amazing person for a lot of reasons. Um, the reason I wanna bring her, her here in front of you all is because of her experience as a writer, as a ghost writer, as an organizer of um, thinking and helping people get the mess out of their head and into books like she did for Russell Brunson, uh, or I should say with Russell Brunson for Expert Secrets. If you have not read this book and you are a speaker, author, coach, expert person who is looking to build an online business around that, this book is a must read. Julie is the mastermind behind that. <laughs> and uh, when I found out that you wrote this book, I was like, oh my gosh, like Ooh, this, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is full. It's not just like ideas, but it's so tactical. It's so organized. It's got, you know, all these concepts. And I know it's, I'm sure. And we talked about it in the podcast episode we did, which I believe is going live right now on the Lift Your LMS podcast called LMS Cast. Um, that we talked about this a lot. So if you're watching this live or you're watching the replay, uh, be sure to check out that podcast episode where we get into the story of this and we'll cover some of those points today, but, uh, I just want to say how excited I am. Julie, welcome to this webinar training. Thank you. And thanks everybody who's watching it. If you're, if you're live or you're, um, or you're watching it on the replay later, or you're watching it on YouTube, I want to assure you that as much of a must read as Expert Secrets is, you have just as much of a much of a must read, as much of a must read, that's a mouthful, uh, in you, like I know you do. And if you're already working on courses or you're already, um, you already have courses and you're trying to sell them, you, you have a message, you have a mission, and we're gonna get to the bottom of that. And I'm gonna show you exactly how to lay a book out that will bring people to your courses and into your business because that's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, this is this is going to be really good. I want to welcome the people that are here with us now. We've got Adam, Allie, Annette, Bob, Brandy, Cody, Dagfin, Emily, John, Jose, Lawrence, Marco, Randall, Rob, Stephen. We've got some more people jumping in. If you're watching this on a live stream on YouTube, go ahead and smash that like button. Um, and this, we are recording this. <laughs> you are gonna, get, you are gonna get uh, the the replay. And at Lift Your LMS, we build kind of a webinar vault. So this isn't going away. If you need to reference this six months from now or three months from now, you're gonna have access to this great presentation. But I would encourage you to stay at the end. Number one, because it's gonna be awesome. Number two, because we're gonna be doing a Lift Your LMS giveaway where we give away a $99 add-on. If you're a customer, don't worry, we're gonna hook you up in a different way. I also want this to be interactive. Uh, we're really lucky to have Julie with us today. So if you have questions, go ahead and uh, type them in the chat, use the Q&A box. Um, we'll we'll get, to, get to the questions, but be interactive. And first, let me just ask what Julie was asking y'all earlier, we've got more people jumping in, is what industry are you in? What niche are you in? What is your course about? What is your domain level knowledge? Where, tell us about this world you're in that has a mess of expertise and experience swirling around in your head. Cause this is, uh, Julie has a talent and a way to help unlock that curse of knowledge that we're gonna get into to today. Um, building a, a online book as like a lead gen and an authority positioning thing. And just because you're awesome is a smart thing to do. If you're not thinking about building a book funnel or, you know, creating a revenue stream through a book um, or just doing it because you feel compelled to do it. Also keep in mind that uh, uh, no matter what you will get value out of this, even just about how to structure and design your course or the path your users go through. And if you're doing the training-based membership site, uh, it's super valuable. 
uh, just the book writing process, the creative process, the way Julie goes, right brain, left brain, let me pull this stuff out of you with questions. <laughs> She's pretty ninja about it. I'm super excited to get into it. Um, do you want, and on that note, Julie, do you want yeah. to um, save questions to the end or do you want me to queue them up as we go? Um, or? So I'll probably stop and, and just sort of gauge it. I, I'm fine with either. Um, I've got all day so and I can talk about this stuff all day so if, it, if people want to hang on till the end or if you've got a question you really want answered right away or or it's just popping into your head I can I can answer them either way but um, I usually will like say okay does that make sense do you have questions like now's the time to ask about this so I've got a whole lot of things I want to um, I want to share with you because basically you the way you learned how to write has been crippling you your whole life and you don't even know it and I want to show you how to write according to the way your brain works. And it's going to help you with so many things. So there's, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, but I'm fine with either one. Okay. That's, that's awesome. And Julie's absolutely right. I'll ask Kathy who's here on the call. Kathy, how long have I been talking about writing a book for Lift Your LMS, the business? <laughs> A long time. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> now that you admitted short. that, you're never gonna get you're never gonna get rid of me because once people <laughs> admit that, seriously, I was interviewed on a podcast um probably six or seven years ago. And the guy uh he actually lives in Portland, Maine. Um he he was like, Oh yeah, I've been thinking about writing a blah blah blah. And I like so every few months I was like, So how's that book coming? So, you your book yet? so what where can I get your book? And and he actually finally did do it kind of I was like, come on. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah. So if you if you've been on the fence, just admit it because we're going to help you today. Um, we've got some people chiming in, just some of the niches, just to fuel Julie with some use cases or examples. And if you hadn't written, if you haven't written in the chat yet, let us know what you're in. We've got a private practice therapist. We've got um, process improvement and lean methodology. Uh, we've got uh what else do we have early reading specialist randall like if you're not writing your own books for your program that is a huge revenue stream for you there's a lady in australia uh who's a friend of mine who teaches um she she teaches a a certain framework around people who have dyslexia and teaching kids with dyslexia how to read. And she has her, she has an entire bookstore that are just her books. Um, and she didn't write them all, but they, they have her name on them and she prints them. And basically she runs her own bookstore with a bunch of, with ghostwriters who write the books for the kids. So that's a huge opportunity. That is, that is awesome. We've got um, user experience for health and human and public services. We've got Forex trading. We've got Adam in the audience who says he's a Chris Badgett expert. That's awesome. <laughs> We've got uh, no. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> We've got uh, Cisco collaboration, um, consulting engineer specializing in precision motion and optics. See, this is how horizontal I my love it. is. This is awesome. There's so much diversity, and every single one of you is going to be able to to and get done with this and and go and hopefully at least have something more structured in your brain on how to do this. Yeah, this is fantastic. We've got Jose on uh, professional development in the Hispanic community. There's just a lot going on. Um, I'm ready to get into it, Julie. Uh, take us in. How do you want right. to? Uh, what I'm going to do, and I hope it works out. If it doesn't, I'll wing it because I'm, I like doing that. <laughs> but I figured that people would probably appreciate some graphic guidance. So um I'm gonna share my screen and then pull up the presentation software. And I think that our faces will still be on there if we do that. Um, here we go. Oh, and just real quick, Emily's asking if everyone can please put your chat on all panelists and attendees so everybody can see the chat. For some reason, when Zoom first loads up, it just says all panelists. So if you switch that to all panelists and attendees, then the whole audience will also be able to see your chat. So thanks for that, Emily. And yeah, we can see uh, we can see your presentation. You see okay, awesome. So it's gonna be, I want it to be full screen though. Hmm, okay, let me see, push the green button. There we go, that's better. All right, so your book is a beacon. 
and look, it's a beacon. It's it's Maine. <laughs> I found it. If you it. don't know, just okay. just so you know, Julie and I live like thirty minutes apart. We both live in Maine, so that's that's what we're talking about. This here. was supposed to be in person, and yeah, then it was stupid <laughs> virus. Now we can't even leave our house to go to go do a webinar together. I'm so. <laughs> um, anyway. So I want to just sort of kick this off right now with a little story from the Coast Guard. And this, I heard this story in some marketing conference a million years ago, um, but it really stuck with me. And I, I want to use it as just sort of a way to set the stage for this whole thing. So they have a saying in, in the Coast Guard that when you are out in a helicopter and you've got one basket to save a whole sea full of drowning people, people who are thrashing around, there was a shipwreck or something. Imagine it's dark and it's like stormy and there's waves everywhere and there's this helicopter and they've got a tiny little raft to lower down and save some people, right? So when they're asked the question, who do you save? The answer that they give is you save the people swimming towards you. You save the people that are swimming towards you, which makes sense, right? If people are swimming away, if you've got, you know, if there's haters or there's people who just aren't paying attention to your marketing or whatever, you don't save them. You don't worry about them. You worry about the people swimming towards you. My question was, okay, how do they know which way to swim? How do they know which way to swim? Because in, in the world of marketing, it's dark and there's waves and there's noise and you're terrified with whatever problem you've got, you're getting divorced, you're losing your kids, you're sick, you're overweight, whatever it is that the problem is, your forex is gone haywire. I don't know. <laughs> so you, you're, you're in this situation, but you don't know where to look. So all you're seeing is little flashes of light everywhere. You're seeing 5,000 flashes of light every single day, 5,000 marketing messages bombard in individuals brain every day between Facebook and the media and TV and all the, all the ways marketing gets to us. They're just little flashes everywhere. And it's very confusing, especially when you're trying to stay afloat, right? So what if there were a safe Harbor that was your course or your business or your consulting or whatever it is that you do. And there is a safe Harbor for those people. All they have to do is know which way to swim right? So what we do is your book, we build your book in the right way so that it becomes a beacon and so that it is shining the light out as far as it possibly can so that people are like, okay, I can ignore all the flash and the noise and all the freaky stuff. And I can just swim towards the light. I can swim towards the light that is steady, that is bright, that doesn't go away and that doesn't move right? A book is permanent. It doesn't move. So it's just like a lighthouse sitting on a rock saying, Hey, come this way. I got you. We can take care of you. There's safe Harbor here. So the whole point of having a book, yes, you, you, you throw words around like, Oh, it's a lead magnet, or I'm going to put it in the top of my funnel or, or whatever. It's a, it, all the fancy marketing names for it. I want you to think of it as this is a beacon that is going to serve me for the next hundred years. 50 years, 10 years, whatever, but it's not going to be a Facebook ad that flashes and goes away or, you know, a, a YouTube channel that flashes and sort of stays around for a little while, but then people get distracted and it goes away. Okay. Does that make sense? We're doing good. I hit totally. you in the heart yet. <laughs> All right. So if your book is a beacon, how the heck do you get one out? Because a lot of people know this. They're like, I want a book. I want a book, but they don't know how to get it out of their head. They don't know how to, um, to make it actually do what, you, what they want it to do. Like they don't know how to make it persuade people to take action. So that's what we're gonna talk about in all of these six steps, okay? So let's get started with why should you invest all this time and energy and money and everything into a book? We just talked about the fact that it is a solid structure. It is a beacon. It's going to draw people to you. One of the biggest things I love to tell people is you get 100% engagement with a book, all right? If somebody is looking and, and choosing to sit down with your book and they are reading it, there are no flashing lights, there's no ads, there's nothing to click, there's no going off the screen, there's no scrolling. 
It's your words and their brain. That's 100% engagement. And as long as you write it correctly and well enough to keep their attention, they're going all the way through and they're not going anywhere. They are going to do whatever you ask them to do next because they are dying for somebody to trust. And a book engenders trust. It's why it has a higher perceived value, especially a print book. And we'll, we'll talk about the differences between the three main versions of print books, eBooks and audiobooks. but it has a higher perceived value. And why is that? Like, why are books so great? Well, because we were taught that the answers are in the book in school, right? They had it drilled into us. Where are the answers? They're in the book. You know, that was all of our homework. Our first big kid job that we had to do when we were growing up was learn how to read. Why? Because reading is key to a successful life, right? So that's why books are like, it's ingrained in our subconscious that they're important and they have higher perceived value than anything else you can possibly put out there as a lead magnet. You also have options for lots of different upsells whether with the different formats. So you give away the digital book and you upsell the print book, for example. Russell will give away the print book and he'll upsell the audio book for like $30. An audio book is way more expensive even though it's not as high a perceived value, which is so weird to me, but it's just psychology is weird, right? <laughs> it's, it's just bizarre. So you have options to, to use it in a lot of different ways. And we're gonna talk about funnels and all the different ways that you can use a book um, in a little while, but I just want to realize that that's a, a really good reason to have one. Also, you get to be a published author. And once you're a published author, you're a published author forever. It's a status point that you don't lose. And it's a status point that almost everybody wants. Everybody wants to write a book. I, somebody did a survey, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And they said that 80% uh, of the people that were asked said they had a book inside them and less than 1% actually ever write anything. And way fewer than that, actually sell it, get it out there, you know, and have something that, that actually happens with their book. So lots of really good reasons to invest time and money and energy. So, but writing a book is so hard. Why is it so hard? If you've tried to write a book, if you have, you know, started, you sit down and you're like, all right, I got this great outline. I'm going to do the out. Oh, this is fantastic. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write an hour a day till it's done. And that never works, right? It's like, I'm going to start Monday on my diet. Never works. Willpower doesn't work. There's a reason why you're struggling with your writing and why it's the way that you were taught has handicapped you your entire life and you don't even know it. It's not your fault. It's not really your teacher's fault because they don't know any other way to do it. But what happened was when you were in school and this goes from grade school all the way up through college, okay? You had a teacher who was who you had to impress. They were the only reader for whatever you were writing. They told you what to write, they told you how long it had to be, and they told you why you were writing. Why were you writing this term paper? Because you wanted to get a good grade and pass the class. Like that's what was at stake, right? So in the grand scheme of your life, getting an A in English class versus making a million dollars in your bank or, or in, your, in your course, <laughs> like there's, you know, there's a, the stakes are different now, right? So your teacher gave you certain parameters. She, she or he told you exactly what you had to do. She gave you boundaries and it was assumed that you already knew who you're writing for and why. So you only had to fill in the information. Does that make sense? Like, like you did what you were told you, you got a good grade or you didn't, your teacher was liked you or didn't like you, whatever, but you, you made it through. But all you were taught to do was regurgitate information. Okay. You were taught to spit out in words, the socioeconomic implications of the French revolution. Okay. In 800 words or less, right? <laughs> That's how we were taught. That's how we practice. We practice how to write a five-part essay introduction, tell them what you're going to say, say it in three things, and then wrap it up by telling them what you already said. Like that doesn't persuade people to take action. That doesn't make them change their life. That doesn't make them buy things. All it does is show that you know stuff. And that's the biggest problem is with books that, especially nonfiction books by experts, the first thing they do is think, what do I want to write? So they're inside their own heads going, okay, what do I want to write about? And that's completely backwards. All you're doing is regurgitating what you know. You sound really smart, maybe, but it doesn't keep the audience's attention because it's not about them, it's about you. So we're going to learn how to go from the outside in 
and reverse engineer a book that actually does what you want it to do and keeps their attention. Do you wanna learn how to do it? Give me a yes in the comments. <laughs> I can't even read them because they're not, I'll they're give you not a yes. on my screen. Are you a yes? Yes, yes, cool. yes, it's coming. All yes, right, yes. so awesome. Does anybody have questions so far? Like before we get into this, because we're getting into the into some heavy stuff here. Not really heavy, it's really easy. <laughs> You're just getting yeses. There's a okay. wall of yeses. All right, hold on to the questions. So if those were the old rules that you learned, I, over the course of, and I didn't even do an introduction, but I've been around for a long time. I've been professionally writing for 30 years and part, it started as journalism, moved into copywriting. I was a copywriter for 20 years. Then all my, all my clients wanted books. So I started ghostwriting and then they started messing up the publishing. So I became a publisher because I didn't want, I was like, I just wrote this great book for you. Don't mess it up. Let me help you publish it. So, um, we, we just came up with these new rules. We were like, look, this, the old way of writing a book doesn't work. The old way of writing, because we aren't taught how to write a book, we were taught how to write papers. So we came up with new rules. And I sort of drilled them down. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them that I teach. You can follow me around and <laughs> you'll, you'll pick them all up eventually. Um, but the one I want to sh share with you today is the three magic questions. These three magic questions are going to help you defeat any blank page. Blank page, you know, where that cursor is blinking at you and going, come on, I dare you to write something. I dare you. Come on, come on. Why aren't you writing yet? Oh my gosh, you must be hungry. Go get a snack. You know, <laughs> I hate that guy. I hate the blank page because he's such a bully. But we're going to turn that blank page into a co-collaborator and actually a, a partner in self-expression. Because when you learn how to do it with the new rules, suddenly the blank page is like, all right, let's go. Come on, let's go. What you got? So it's, it just flips the frame around, which is awesome. It also, this, these three magic questions are also going to help you make any writing you do more persuasive. So any writing from an email sequence to a landing page to your course notes, course notes are huge, right? Um, any kind of funnel copy that you have to write, any articles that you're writing, anytime you're writing a keynote speech or doing a webinar with somebody else, all of those things, super important. And I realize right now that this little screen is covering things up. Oh, well, that's okay. You get the point. There's question one, question two, question three. Here we go. Question we don't one. see anything in the way, by the way. So. You don't see? Oh, good. Because I, it's like this, this screen is covering everything up for me. That's good to know. All right. So the first question is, who is your audience? Who are you talking to? See, it sounds really obvious, but there's a few problems where that you, you're like, oh, well, it's, it's my avatar. It's the people who are going to buy my course. It's my students, right? When you were in school, you learned that the audience was the teacher. Maybe if you had a really good teacher, like Mr. Bracco, my sixth grade science teacher who forced us to do Friday stand up and give oral presentations, then maybe it was your class, but most likely it was your teacher. So you had certain things you had to do to impress them and to keep their attention. They were looking for certain things. Well, your audience is looking for certain things too, but it's not what's in, not, it's not, it's not everything that you know. The problem with, with everything you know is that it's too much. You know too much. That's why we get writer's block because you have, you're an expert. You have so much information in your brain and you're such a giving person that you want to share it all. Therefore, you try to jam it all into a book and it just, you're like, what is this? It's too confusing or it doesn't keep my attention or I don't need this. Is, that's how people give up because it just, it's too much. So if you know who your audience is, and we're going to get, we're going to, we're going to refine that a little more in, in question two. Some people will tell me, but I have more than one audience. You know, I have, I have, um, how to do Forex for blue collar workers, how to do Forex for retirees. I don't know. I don't know anything about Forex. It's just sticking in my brain. Um, but you know, I have a lot of different audiences. Well, when you're online, what do you do? You make a different landing page right? You write a different email sequence. You customize the message to your audience. You got to do the same thing in a book, but the problem is, is that it's hard to do that in a, in an easy way. Most people, it's like, I just want to write one book. I don't want to write 15 books, right? You could write 15 books and many people will, but what you want to do is figure out who is your most common audience. Who is the, which audience that you have is the one you are most frequently speaking to and write down what you know about them. How old are they? 
What's their education? What's their income level, if that matters? All the things that you need to know about the audience, and you're gonna write it on an index card, top of an index. You're gonna write three things. The answers to these three magic questions are gonna go on an index card, and I want you to staple it to your computer. <laughs> Do not forget these things because when you forget the answers to these three questions, that's when you get lost and you get stuck while you're writing. <clears throat> Happens every time in between your start and your halfway point on your first draft. Every time people forget. So write down who's your audience. Question two is what is the purpose? Why are you writing this book? What are you, some people will call it the big promise of the book. Like why, what are they going to get out of it? If you, if, if they read the book, okay. Are they going to lose weight? Are they going to learn how to do Forex? Are they going to learn how to sell their house? Are they going to learn, you know, how to teach their kids how to read whatever it is. There's a purpose for the book. It is not to tell them everything you know about your topic, because if that's your purpose, you're going to bore them. You're going to confuse them and they're not going to buy your course. Or anything else you've got. They're going to be like, oh, that person's too, too, what it, what it does is it makes the reader feel inferior, it makes them feel like, you know, too much and they, and you're above them and they want to find someone a little more accessible. So they'll go to your competitor, which we don't want. Right? So the way that you figure out what the purpose is and the way you, you refine what you're going to write in your book is you say, all right, who is this audience? Where are they at point A? Where are they when they start reading this book? Most importantly, what do they believe that's wrong? What, how do they think about what you do? What objections do they have? Like, where are they in their minds? Or if you're in a weight loss niche, you know, where are they physically? So let's just, let's just take weight loss. I've got a hundred pounds to lose. I've given up all hope of ever losing weight. I'm sure it's my genetics. I've got fibromyalgia and there's just no way I can ever lose weight. Like that's a point A. We wrote a book that took a lady from 30,000 a year to 10 million in three years because that was her point A for her people. And her point B was, I think I can do this. That was all it was. The only purpose of this book that we wrote, which is if you're looking for it because it's, it's awesome. Code Red Revolution. The only purpose of the book was to get them from I give up to I think maybe I can do this. So if you've got a point A and a point B, you have a book because the book is the stuff that gets them from point A to point B. It's all the stuff in the middle. And anything else that you know about the topic does not belong in the book. <laughs> this is setting your parameters. This is your teacher telling you, I only want to know the top three reasons why slavery was bad or whatever. Like, like this is your teacher giving you parameters. This is you setting the parameters because you don't have a teacher here and you know the topic better than anybody else. So what's point A, what's point B? The only thing that goes in your book, in your outline, in your text, in your manuscript is the stuff in between those two points. That goes on your index card. What's point A, what's point B? Finally, what's the goal? Why are you writing this book? What do you want to get out of it? Do you want to sell a course? Do you want to have people hire you to consult? Do you want them to hire you to speak? Maybe you want all of those things. Do you just want them to change their lives? Do you want them to donate to your nonprofit? Do you want them to go out and plant a victory garden? What is it that you want to do? That's really important too. You put that at the bottom because what happens is if people forget the goal or they don't think about the goal to start with, they write a great book, but then the action that they want doesn't happen. They don't sell a lot of courses. They're like, but I wrote a great book and everybody loves it. And I have 3 million five-star reviews on Amazon. Why doesn't anybody buy my course? Because you didn't know that that was a goal in the beginning and you didn't include the things that need to be included to make that happen. So I have this little, um, oh, let's go. Well, they all have to be aligned. There was an arrow. <laughs> there was an arrow on there for the three questions. What you do is you write those three things down, answer the questions first. Then you go back, you start at the bottom and you go back up and you make sure everything aligns starting with your goal, because you're the one putting in the time, blood, sweat, and tears and money to make this happen. So start with your goal, go back up to the purpose. Okay. 
If I take them to point B, will they be ready to convert? Will they be ready at point B to buy my course? Yes, awesome, that aligns. What's next? Am I talking to the right person? Yes, okay, you've got a book. Like that's the hardest part. And, and that's the thing that you have to remember all the way through your book, all the way through your course, all the way through any piece of sales copy that you are writing. Same three questions, audience, purpose, goal. Because the problem with writing is you could write anything and you could write forever and you want it to actually have things happen. So we wanna, we wanna put those guidelines and parameters in place. Any questions about that so far? Yeah, we've got some questions coming in, but first, uh, just let us know down in the chat, which did you need to hear most? The person, the purpose, or the goal? Which one do you find the most valuable? And you're, you're talking about one index card to keep you focused, right? Like yes. put, put, it, put it there. Always, like, and if you get stuck, this is why. Almost every single time until you get to the next, there's five sticking points, but this one will keep you stuck for years is yeah. because you forget and you'll write and you'll write and you'll write and you'll write or you won't write and you won't know why you're not writing it's because you forgot you know you forgot who you're writing to and what you're trying to say this is steven, a magic way to get it out of your head and and down into an outline steven asked um he's talking about different mark people or market segments there's second income there's home workers there's new career people there's covid19 mm -hmm. homebound people how do you focus the person this so, is for what he's asking. so for COVID-19, that's a blog post. You, you don't want to, you could call it an emergency situation or something else. You want this book to last. You want it to last for 50, 100 years. You want it to have truths that stay relevant. By the, if you wrote about COVID-19, by the time it got published, it would be already be irrelevant. People will have forgotten about it. Or if they haven't forgotten about it, it won't be immediate in their lives. And you need that to be immediate in their lives now. So write a short article or write an ebook just for that. But for the others, you can do it a few ways. You can write different books. You can write different chapters. I like to have, like you write the overall frameworks, but one of the keys to having a successfully converting book where they, they go from the book right into your course is to have uh, free resources available. Lead magnets in your lead magnet, go figure, right? <laughs> yeah. Lead magnets in your lead magnet to bring people from the book to your website. So you say, hey, I've got a great interview series about this particular subject. If you are in this audience, go check it out because we're, we go in deeper into what you need for that market. So that is so cool. Different things, yeah. And I mean, that takes planning and that's why you have to be yeah. clear. If the goal is to get them on your email list, add value with the book and then sell them the course or the membership later, you know, you need to plan that out and have yeah. them going to your website to get resources and things. Right. And one of the things, one of the ninja tricks that I tell people is instead of having a PDF they can download or a blog post they can go look at on your website, like that's nice and all, but there people have a subconscious reaction to that and they go, well, why didn't they just write it in the book? So okay. instead I say, have it be an audio or a video resource and it can just be you talking, it's fine, but have those, have it be a, an obvious reason why it's not in the book. And, and then they'll be like, oh, here's my email all day long. I just want to get that audio. But pro if it's tip. PDF, they're like, mm. <laughs> That's a pro cool. tip right there. Um, Jose wants to hear a little more about the purpose. Can you like, as an example, since this audience is somewhat familiar with this book, the, yep. you wrote Expert Secrets. What's the purpose of this book for ClickFunnels or Russell Brunson? Okay, so we wrote dot-com secrets first. And the purpose of that book was to get people to understand what the heck a funnel was because ClickFunnels almost didn't make it because people were not getting it. They didn't understand. And, and he tr was trying to do webinars and teach people and they didn't get it. And they're like, oh, that's because they don't know what a funnel is. So the purpose of that book was to get them from point A, I have a struggling business to point B, you're struggling because you don't have a funnel. Oh, well, go to go buy ClickFunnels. In Expert Secrets, um, the goal was to expand the market to experts, to people who knew stuff and wanted to share it, wanted to get it out in the form of courses and webinars and everything. But the only way they were going to be successful and like really successful was if they built a mass movement. So we, that was point A was I have this knowledge. Point B could have been, this would, if, if Chris had written Expert Secrets, it would have been point A is I have this expertise. Point B is here's why and how you should 
you should have your own course, right? And then go buy Lyft or LMS. But for Russell, it was, I've got this information and I need to share it as broadly as possible. Because if they want to learn how to build a funnel, they can go back to experts or to dot-com secrets and learn that. But he wanted to share with them how to build a mass movement and really explode your following so that you have tons of people who would bring you into, into your funnel. That's awesome. And so is the, um, the difference between the purpose and the goal. The purpose is really for your audience and the goal is for you yep. selfishly, yourself, your business, yep. your whatever you're trying to achieve. Exactly. The, the goal is the conversion point. The goal and point B are the same. You want to get them from the book, from where they believe right now. And this is all in expert secrets, by the way. This is, this is like part of their, that framework as well. But bringing them from point A to changing their beliefs about what you do to, okay, I think I could do this, but I need, I need further help. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But yeah, point, the goal and point B are pretty much the same. That's the conversion point. And we're getting a question coming up from Deborah about how do you do this with a fast changing topic like SEO in her case? <laughs> oh God. Okay. So SEO. So I have a friend, Catherine Rose, who, who wrote one of the first books about Facebook okay. and she wrote every little thing about Facebook. She wrote that book eight times. Because every time she released it, something would change and she'd rewrite it and then she'd rewrite it again. And she, so you don't want to do that. The, um, one of my friends, Rich Brooks, wrote a book called The Lead Machine. And he had that exact problem because he runs a digital marketing agency. And one of his big things is, is SEO. And so he was like, I can't talk about the, the super specific tactics because they'll be outdated by the time it's published. And even if it's not, it'll be outdated in, in two years. So he had to go broader. He had to kind of look at a, at a bird's eye view and go, okay, what are the truths about SEO? The truths are search engines are here and they're real. And it's not just Google, it's Amazon and YouTube and everything else is a search engine. You shouldn't try to game them. Don't game them, but keyword, yeah. keywords are important. That's another thing I would include. Um, What's, what is backlinking and what is anchor text? Like those kinds of things that don't change, even though algorithms change, um, that's the kind of thing you want to do. Just sort of step back a little bit and, and look at a magnified view rather than the tactics go for strategies and say, oh, by the way, if you want to learn the actual tactics of how you get more backlinks for your thing, hey, I've got a course. I'm like <laughs> your course sells the tactics. The book is explaining the how it's getting them from, I don't even know what SEO is to point B of, oh, now I get it and I need to be able to do it myself or hire someone. And if you have a membership going with your site, you can have a new report about what's new this month and now you're into recurring revenue. Yeah. Just having a newsletter that goes out that's paid is, yeah. is great. Don't, one, one thing I would caution you about is, is a lot of people will say, you know, anytime there's an update on this topic, I'll update this web page. So just go check that web page. That's great for about two months and then you get tired of it. <laughs> yeah, you forget about it or the audience forgets about it. You want them in your world. You want them to opt in for something. So give them something that they can actually buy and be in your world rather than something that maybe they'll check out the page and maybe they won't. Um, we've got another question. Maybe we can hit this one and then move on. Salim is asking... I think this is kind of a mindset question a little bit, but um, basically saying that the youth, the the reading is going, the habit of reading is going down. Like if, so what does that say about like who the audience is? Like what, how do you make something so compelling that regardless of trends out in the world that like people read less or whatever, like how do we get past these kinds of concerns? First of all, I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. People do read. There's a, there's a few answers to that question. And that's a really good question because a lot of people are like, oh, nobody reads in my, in my world. Why should I waste my time? Why, I'll just do a video. Yeah. So the act of reading may be going down. Part of, there's two reasons for that. Part of that is because the quality of books that are being published are abysmal for the most part. And people just, they pick up bad book after bad book after bad book. 
they will read a book that's good and captures their attention and is focused on them and their problem and getting them from point A to point B. They will read that book, promise you. The other thing is, even if it were true that no one reads anymore, the perception of a published author does not go away. That is more, more important than it ever was, especially a respected published author. There's a lot of things out there right now, like, oh, I'll get a guaranteed bestseller. Like the bestseller status thing is, is not as important as having a book that people consume and read and love and immediately go and buy, buy whatever it is that you want them to buy. So they don't read. The other thing I tell people, I have so many things, and I could do a whole webinar on just this, um, is, is that whether or not someone reads your book, if they come in contact with it, number one, they know you're an author, which immediately puts you above your competition if they are not. Number two, they are going to judge you <laughs> based on what they see when they look at that book, which means, is it professionally, is the cover professionally designed? When they look inside on Amazon and they flip through a few pages, does it make any sense? Is it well-written? Is it well-edited? Does it have halfway decent reviews? All of those things are, are trust signals that people are going to judge whether or not they ever read your book or not. So it's important that if you decide to do it, that you do it well, because <laughs> There's, it's just, there's a, it's so easy to publish now. It's so easy to publish. There's a million books published every single year and 99.9% .9 of them are terrible. And they're just, they don't do the job. They don't, and, and so people get like, oh, this is another bad book, crap. <laughs> but the good books get talked about and talked about and talked about and there's word of mouth. And, and I mean, all of our authors that we work with one-on-one -on -one have gone, their businesses have exploded because their books were good. And, and it's, there's just no other way around that, but yeah, people will read it if it's, if it's relevant and it captures their attention. Well, let's keep rolling as okay. you're, as you're moving on, Randall Klein is saying in all caps, my mind is expanding. Great stuff. There's lots of exclamation points. Yay! So. I'm so glad Randall, <laughs> that's the whole goal is to expand your brain. Right. All right. So let's talk about your funnel, how to use your book inside of your sales funnel. Now you may not, you don't, first of all, I use the word funnel because that's the word. And because I've been in, in indoctrinated with Russell's world, just from writing his books for so long. Um, but you do not have to have a specific piece of software. If you don't want, you can, you can build a funnel on Shopify. You can build it in, in WordPress, anything that you do. All it means is you're getting people in the top for, for low cost or free, a lead magnet, and it's progressing them through a buying journey rather than asking them to click around and hoping that they find something, hoping they land on your landing page and hoping that they like it and hoping it's the right one for the right audience. It's just leading them down a path by going, okay, you clicked on this button, therefore this is the next thing, this is the next thing, this is the next thing. So it's, it's just a word, it doesn't mean you have to buy certain software, anybody can do this, okay? Once you have your book, what do you do with it, <laughs> right? Everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to sell it and I'm going to make a million dollars. You don't make money selling your book. You can make some. Um, and, and if you are, you know, Brian Tracy or Seth Godin or Russell Brunson, you can make, you can make decent money on the actual purchase of the book. And we're going to talk about some ways to do that. But more often, especially if you have a sales funnel and especially if you have online courses, giving away your book at the front end is going to be more lucrative for you um, in the long run. So let's just look at a few ways to sell your book. You can, you know, and there's, there's pricing strategies and all, a lot of things I can't get into right now, but um, you sell your book on your website. You keep hundred percent of whatever the profits are. You don't keep hundred percent of the revenue because you have to pay for printing and shipping and all that, but you do get hundred percent of the revenue. Um, or, so then you have Amazon. You absolutely want your book on Amazon. Even if you plan to give it away, you want it there because that gives it legitimacy. People will, will get interested in a book. And then the first thing they're going to do is go check it out on Amazon. They're going to look at the reviews. They're going to look at the description. They're going to see if they can look inside of it. So you need to, you need to be there because if, if you're not, they're like, oh, it's not really a real book. I'm not going to bother. Right. So, and that's not hard to put it up there. You don't, you don't have to print a million copies and stick them in your garage or any of that. It's, it's pretty simple. You can also sell your book through other people. Who do you know with the same target audience? 
What other companies do you know with the same target audience? What other physical products would be really great as, you know, they would love to have your book as well. There's um, any, any major appliance that's been trending right now, like the, the Instant Pot and the Foodie Grills and the George Form, all the, all the fancy appliances that take up way too much counter space from, from my kitchen. Um, all of those have an entire army of books that have been written to supplement those, those um, appliances. The, the appliance companies themselves will put out books that go with it, but every other, every other internet marketer has got a book on Amazon about how to use the George Foreman grill and what recipes to use. And then there's another one about keto with George Foreman. And then there's another one about well, yeah, whatever. So you can, you can piggyback on other people and other companies and other products. You can also get your books in bookstores. Now, bookstores are the worst places to sell books. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Terrible places to sell books because it's rigged and has been rigged since the 19th century to favor the big traditional publishers. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a racket. You can get into them though, if your book is um, a mainstream topic that someone who just happened to be browsing a bookstore might wanna buy or if, um, if, your, oh, if your book is professionally produced. So you, it needs to, if you can self-publish it and still get into a bookstore, but it has to be done a certain way and it has to be available through certain um, distribution channels. So that's, that's a whole nother bazillion year webinar, but you can get into bookstores. People will say you can't self-publish, no bookstore will touch you. That used to be the case, but it's not anymore. You can also do what's called non-retail special sales which is any other place besides a bookstore <laughs> that sells books. Okay, and actually some of them are retail, some of them are not. You know, a university bookstore is one example. Um, a military base is another example. I have um, a book, The Work at Home Success Guide is a book I wrote a few years ago. We're trying to get it into PXs because there's so many military wives and husbands who are sitting at home and, and want to work and want to do things, but they, they move around too much to get traditional jobs. So there's all kinds of ways that you can, um, you can sell your book through non-traditional channels, gift shops, libraries. Libraries is more of the giving away books, but, um, but libraries do buy books. Actually, libraries are one of the biggest buyers of books. So if you have a mainstream topic, um, like, uh, I forget the person's name, but whoever's doing the, the, the how to teach children how to read, that's like a no brainer for a library to buy a whole lot of copies of that book, right? And all the books that go in that series, right? Also schools, would that's a no brainer for schools. Homeschools, homeschooling is really popular right now. Really good time to have those books available for people, right? So that's a whole lot list of ways that you can sell your book and make money off of it. And because you wrote it the right way, you have a conversion point and you will get people to come hopefully and, and purchase your other products, hire you to speak or whatever. Giving your book away is more effective in most cases of people who have the online savvy to, to know about it. Mainly because the, of the psychological trigger of the word free, which is like, oh, I get a book for free. <laughs> Yay, I get a book. If it's great, if it's a great book and people really want to read it, it is. If it's not, it's like, oh, great. Now what do I do with it? We're hardwired to not throw books away. I have books that I've gotten at conferences that were terrible. They were terrible books, but I couldn't physically throw it away because I just, you don't throw away books. It's just, ugh. so what do we do? We either pass it on or we put it on our bookshelf and, and that brand is looking me in the face all the time, right? I find it maybe 10 years later and I'm like, oh, this wasn't such a bad book after all. Or, oh, that's right. I was going to call that guy and hire him to speak or whatever. So they still have use. But a free plus shipping funnel is uh, very popular right now. I'm sure you have all seen, um, you know, buy my book. I, I, bought, I bought the book for you. All you have to do is pay, is pay shipping. And that is an entire process where you give the book away you have them pay a $7.95 or $8.95 or whatever shipping charge, shipping and handling, which most of the time covers the shipping. You are still paying for the book. I mean, you are still putting money into that book, into that process. So you might be down three, four, five dollars for every person who, who takes you up on that offer. But immediately after that, you have an upsell. You have an upsell for your course. 
or for an introductory level of your course. And sometimes you have two or three upsells and sometimes you have an upsell and then a downsell if they didn't buy it. And so what you end up with, what Russell ends up with is a $200 purchase at the end of every book he gives away. So that's wow. pretty sweet. And that doesn't even count the monthly recurring on ClickFunnels, okay? He just, he just gives away as many books as he possibly can. Because he has that kind of a return, what does he get to do? He gets to pay JV partners and affiliates. To, like when we were doing Dotcom Secrets, which is the first book, he paid every single person who gave away a book, who sent people to, to the, the website where he was giving away the book. He gave every single person 20 bucks for every book. So this is a free book and he's giving away $20 to the referral source and he's paying for the, the, for the printing and shipping. And like, how is that working? It, it seems like he's down 40 bucks, but he's actually up 150, <laughs> right? Plus he gets people to go into ClickFunnels. So that's a very popular method right now, depending on your sophistication of your market. If this is, if this is something that's super popular right now, it might be getting old. I personally am so tired of seeing free plus shipping offers, but I'm in that world. I'm in there all the time. Most niches don't have a lot of that happening. So if you're not in the, in the digital marketing, make money space, then you're probably okay. Um, another way you can give your book away is at, at, at keynotes or presentations that you do. If you back of the room speaking, hey, I've got a gift for you. Or put it, put it, this is really popular. Put a book on every seat in the room that they get to keep. Like it's a sales letter. It's a huge sales piece that they're going to take home with them no matter whether they were, you know, not listening during the presentation or they just, they didn't get it, but they, they want to dive in further or they're just not sure, or they're, you know, they were worried about something. They're going to take your book home. And if it's interesting to them, they're going to read it. You can give it away at trade shows. This is one of my favorite things to do. Trade shows and exhibits and places where you are buying sponsorship for a big booth. Everybody gives away pens and candy and hats and weird things, right? But if you give away your book, that's something that that's actually going to convert them into a customer. It's, it's so much more valuable. Also, it allows you to be at multiple trade shows at the same time without having a massive sales force because you can say, hey, I want to buy a spot in your goodie bag. Put my book in there. And you can be in every trade show across the country. I mean, there's none right now. <laughs> when they come back and they will come back, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great way to expand your presence even if you're not at that show. You can also um, put your book on other people's thank you pages, other people's funnels, other, you know, have swaps. You can have email list swaps. There's a million ways to do this. I have an entire book on how to do this, but um, right now I just want to give you the big ones. So any have questions on how to use your book inside your funnel at this point? I think we're good so far. Good. Awesome. I'm going to take and, uh, gonna Jose's take just saying. Water. Jose is just saying that he thinks the combination of a free book and a paid course in Lifter LMS is a win. Yep. Also had a, just a quick question for you that I was always curious about. You're the expert. How, what's up with the airport bookstore? They're super small. Like that's like, I mean, what's the, like, where do those choices come from? That's a pay to play. That's okay. another situation where it is set up for the traditional publishers. So the books that you see in there, are books that have are participating in what's called co-op marketing, which okay. means that the author is paying $25,000 to have a few copies of their book in that store as part of the advertising budget. It's, it's a really weird kind of sick system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was set up a long time ago before digital publishing was around and before we had other ways to get our books out there. Everyone goes, I want to be in the airport bookstores. And it's like, okay, great. That's really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard and it's really expensive. It, it, it really is. It's a pay to play. Um, the, the books you do see there from traditional publishers, even those authors have paid 10, 15, $25,000 for that placement. Any book you see in a Barnes and Noble that's face out, that author paid for that placement. Anyone you see on a table, all of that is paid. And nobody. So the reality is, it's not. It's not based on merit. It's not. It's not a democracy. There's there's mechanics in place that and that money is flowing. there to make money. And there's a tiny yeah. tiny margin. So yeah. they have to know it's going to sell. If they know it's going to sell, 
they're going to stock it, but they're going to make you pay for it. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> there's so many better, better options than that. All right, let's move on. So there's three things that you have to have in your book if you want it to be successful to convert into a sale for something else. Actually, if you even just want them to convert into reading the damn thing, because that's a conversion point, right? Buying the book is a conversion point or, or deciding that you want it for free. Opening the first page is a conversion point. Continue Every page they turn is a conversion point and you have to keep up that pace. Otherwise, you know, people think, oh, well, the only, the only conversion point I need to worry about is, is at the end when they, when they go buy my course, but that's not really true. <laughs> you got it. You got to keep getting them to commit. And you know, if you've ever heard about micro commitments, if you've ever studied persuasion, the more micro commitments that a person makes, it's been proven that the more likely they are to make a big commitment. Right. So, um, in, in the case of, I have to tell a story, but I'll get way off track, so I won't. So in the case of a book, just opening the book first and scanning through it, that's a conversion point, right? That's a little micro commitment. I am willing to spend five minutes of my time skimming through this and see if it's interesting or not. Then it's like, oh, I'm going to make, I, I'm really interested in this, this table of contents is amazing. Like Table of contents is your best sales tool, just saying. Um, you know, it looks really interesting. I got to go see what's in chapter seven. That's another micro commitment. Then they read chapter seven. That's another micro commitment. Then they keep going and they keep going and they keep going. They're like, oh God, I forgot the first six chapters. Let me go back and read that. And then they're like signing up on your website and they're watching your YouTube channel. And all of that is they're all micro commitments that are getting them more and more into trust mode. Like this is the person I'm trusting to help me with this problem. So very cool. All right. So the three things you need to succeed and be persuasive in your writing and in your book. So any piece of writing, but especially a book. The first one is you need to inspire. You have to be inspirational in your book. And I don't mean like woo woo kumbaya, like that, like what, I mean, unless kumbaya is your business and then that's awesome. And you want to do that. But the whole point of inspiring people is that you help them believe they can do it. They have to believe that whatever you're sharing with them is possible for them. Because the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go, well, that's great, Russell Brunson, for you, but you're like this great big digital marketing god and you know how to do all this stuff and you've been doing it forever and I could never do that. Right? That's a huge objection. And people automatically assume that an author is a superhero and that they have special powers. So you have to you have to inspire them with other stories of when you weren't a superhero, of your clients and their journeys, of other people in in history who had similar journeys. You need to inspire with stories so they are like, "Oh my gosh, I can do this. I can, I can do this." Yes, that's what what the Code Red Revolution was all about. She has seven really simple rules. Her whole $10 million business is built off of drink water, eat real food and sleep. That's it. Like there's a few other little things in there, but that's pretty much it. And how do you write a book about that? And how do you use a book that is actually going to like make a difference in people's lives? You had, we had to inspire. We had to put in a ton of success stories. And really when you're reading a weight loss magazine or a fitness magazine, what's the first thing you do? If you're a woman that, you know, we go to the success stories. We want to see, oh my God, I'm just like her. I can do this. Right. That's why success stories work. There's always a before and an after the, the power is in the during, but most people don't know that <laughs> most people is just like before I was hundred pounds overweight after look, I'm, I'm surfing or whatever. <laughs> like it's, that's what, what they need to see. They need to see that they can do it. The second thing they need to know is you have to educate them. They have to know how to do it. It's no good for them to believe they can do something if you don't tell them how to do it. Because you know what's going to happen? They're going to go find you somebody else who will tell them. And then they're going to buy their per that person's products and that person's courses. So you have to educate so that they know how to do the thing. And you have to sell. People don't like that word sometimes. <laughs> I love that word. You have to sell additional resources and support. Otherwise, they're not going to do the thing. They believe the thing, they, they believe they can do it, they know how to do it, but when was the last time you believed you could do something and you knew how to do it and you're like, I'm gonna write a book. 
oh, never mind. <laughs> you know, it, goes, it gets hard and it goes on the back burner if there's no accountability, if there's no continued guidance. That's why I guide people on how to write their books. If there isn't that there inside of the book and you don't have a way to get people to your website and a way to continue to guide them, they are never going to do the thing. Maybe. Maybe they'll never do the thing. Maybe they will. A really good book will help people do the thing even without your help, but then they want to share the book because they had success and they want to talk about their success and people ask them about their success. So they connect with you anyway. It's called the ripple effect. And it's, um, Christy has built her, the Code Red Revolution um, author has built her entire business on this ripple effect because people have amazing success. Some of them buy her program, some of them don't, some of them go on her online challenges, some of them do nothing but read the book and they have amazing success. So selling is, is all about support, resources, additional ways that those people can connect with you because they trust you now and they want you to help them. They don't want someone else to help them. They want you to help them. And it's not good enough to just hope that they'll find you online. You have this tool in their hands, give them a way, give them a reason to flip from the book to the website. One of the other things, and this is the last thing I want to say about selling is um, it's been studied that it's studied and proven that a book is passed around about nine times before it dies, before it goes away, before it just never comes out again. So you might know who bought your book. You probably won't, but you might. You might know that they went through your funnel and you have their email address and that's awesome, but you don't know if they left it on an airplane and, and somebody found it and read it and hired that author for you know, $20,000. That has happened to one of my clients. You don't know who gave that book to their friend. You don't know who bought it for everyone they know for Christmas. Like you don't know all of these other things and how often that book has been around spreading your message. That's why your book is a beacon. It's pushing out the light as much as it can. And it's doing the work for you. People who, you know, live halfway across the world and may never in a million years see your Facebook ads but they got your book because they found it on an airplane. <laughs> like how, you know, it's crazy how that works, but it does. It really does. And you can't do that with digital marketing. You just can't. That's why it's a great tool to add to that digital marketing arsenal that you have. All right. So anybody, any questions so far? We got one more little bit. Um, well, I just wanted to ask you that are watching and listening here, what do you need to do more of for your course? Or if you're thinking about doing a book, do you need to inspire? Do you need to educate? Or do you need to sell? And I love how you practice what you preach, Julie, inspiring, like <laughs> we're weaving in the Code Red Revolution and the story of that, Russell Brunson, the story of that, the Facebook person mm -hmm. and, and their story, like story is a part, that's the difference between a textbook and a book that we, we enjoy more, right? right? Like there's- And if you look at textbooks nowadays, they're full of stories. Okay. I mean, it's been a while. So yeah. no, me too. Thank God. <laughs> Those suckers are expensive. People are like, how much did I charge for my book? I'm like, I don't know. How much is it worth? <laughs> like, it's $800 last time I bought a college textbook. So what's the, um, Deborah saying she needs to sell more. I mean, in this audience, I see people one of two ways, either they're like too focused on selling or they're not selling at all. Like if somebody has like an adverse uh, effect to like sales and marketing? How do you kind of wiggle them loose? You mentioned looking at selling as supporting as resources, mm -hmm. but like, how, how do you get somebody who's a little reticent about sales and marketing to just get, get over it and move on? Oh man, I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I'm one of those people and I, and I, and I have gotten over it. Um, and it really has been just a mindset adjustment. But when it comes to a book, people are like, they're, they are the same way. They're one of two camps. They're like, I'm going to, this is a sales letter. This is a 200 page sales letter. And that's all I'm going to do. And I'm going to write it like a sales letter. And there are a lot of books out there like that, but people see through it. People know what a sales letter is now. They know what you're doing. And it's really obnoxious most of the time. Some of the times it's very well done, but most of the time it's really obnoxious. And so I, I have um, a few ways Actually, I have four ways that I teach people to put sales messages in their book without actually saying, buy my stuff, right? Right. Expert Secrets is full of sales messages, but you don't know it. 
right? You don't realize what's happening. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're breaking false beliefs, you're reframing, you're, you're inspiring them so that they can do something. And you're doing it in, in ways that they remember. You're dropping dopamine into people's system. You're dropping serotonin into people's system. This is part of our framework in the Nonfiction Book Academy is how to get people addicted to your content by using their brain chemicals. Because every feeling that you have in your entire body, every experience you ever have is just a chemical that dripped out of your brain into the rest of your body. Like that's mm -hmm. all it is. So if you know how to drop the, the chemicals, you get them addicted to continuing to read or continuing to buy or continuing to consume your product. That's why gamification works so well in courses is because every time they get that next level and that little bing, they're like, woohoo. I mean, they may not even notice it. Like they may be like, whatever, this is stupid. But in their, in their subconscious, like, yes, I got a dopamine. Yay. <laughs> it was like Pac-Man eating the little things. Um, but when I, when we talk about how to, how to sell without selling in a book, we have, um, 3D, I call it 3D calls to action, which is just bringing people from a book to a website. Um, and that's those resources and support. Like, hey, I've got a video on this. Hey, I've got an audio on this. You can put those at the end of every single chapter. You can have it in one big long page at the back. You can have both. You can have all kinds of different ways that you weave in offers, free offers for them to come and engage with you on a website. Another thing that you can do is to uh, what I call seeding, which is just saying Russell seeds like a crazy person <laughs> in all of his content. He's just like, yeah, so our, our inner circle person, our, our inner circle member, Liz Benny, and she did this thing and blah, 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 blah. And this is her, her great success. And, and, you know, and in this program, we did this. And in that thing, we did, he doesn't have nearly as many programs now as he did, but he would just drop within the, in the course of the sentence, a seed. Oh, his client so-and-so did this. I did it with Christy, my client, Christy. I'm doing it right now with Russell, my client, Russell. You know, in the back of your head, oh, she has clients, right? That's just a seed that you drop along the way. So in my course about reading, you know, teaching five-year-olds to read, you know, this was, this was a success story that we had or, or whatever. Um, the other thing you can do is you can have advertising, advertising, every single book on your shelf, I guarantee has advertising in it. It's in the back especially fiction. Fiction books have advertising. If you ever, ever looked at the back of a book, sometimes in the front, but usually in the back, you say, oh, here are some other books by this author. Oh, here are some ways that you can get in touch with the author. Oh, here are some other books by this publisher. Some books have like 10 pages of advertising in the back. It's your book. You're the boss. You can put whatever you want in there. And people expect ads in the back. They're used to it. It's not a big deal. Having a big old ad for your course in the back of your book is not a big deal. It really isn't. On that note, there, we have a question from Douglas who says that one or two seats in a, uh, one of his workshops could generate as much revenue as the book would do in a year. That sales conversation he needs to figure out. Like, so how do you make the turn from the book to I have some kind of high high end workshop you may have to travel to maybe great distance. Like, how do you make the turn? So what I do, so one thing that you can do is, is offer um, a high value bonus in the beginning of the book, um, which is just basically saying, hey, well, there's a companion workbook or there's an, a quiz you can take or there's something that you go and you opt in for that has more value than the purchase of the book itself. So I have, I, I helped someone write a chapter for a book called um, Google AdWords for Dummies way back in the day way back in the day, had every book that is Google AdWords for dummies has not dummies. Um, the ultimate guide to Google AdWords has a big banner on it that says $50 and free Google ads. So yeah. it's $25 to buy the book and $50 to go get that thing. I'm going to go get that thing. Right. Yeah. So you want to have your system set up and your conversion point set up and your funnel set up so that they're going to go to that event but you've got to lead them in a little at a time with something that's relevant to somewhere between point A and point B. So a lot and of micro work. commitments and then it keeps micro building, commitments, building. Get them on your, get them on your mailing list. Then what do you do? Well, you send them through the sequence. You could, um, what one thing, I, I don't know anything about this guy's business, so I'm, it's hard for me to make things up, but one thing you could do is have a video session where you do a hot seat with someone who went to the event. 
and you just do an interview with people who went to that event and talk to them about their success and their results and what they learned. And then you offer that as a free, oh, hey, I've got these video series. You would love to watch this because it's going to, and you don't even have to mention your event. Just say, hey, I have this video series. It's all of our most successful students giving away their, their secrets. Yeah. They're going to go and check that out. And it's going to be, oh, by the way, this was filmed at such and such event. Want to come? So yeah, <laughs> it, just, it just keeps right? yeah. yeah, Yeah. That's super cool. And a couple more questions coming in. When things go poorly, especially around selling, um, Deborah was just concerned or had seen people end up with a bunch of negative reviews on Facebook. So what should, or not Facebook, Amazon, mm -hmm. what, um, what do authors do wrong? I mean, everybody's got a hater. Maybe there's one or two, one stars or whatever, but how do you accidentally end up with an overwhelming uh, negative reviews on you Amazon? probably have a competitor who's hiring people to go do that. Or you wrote a really crappy book. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so what I tell people to do, we, we have a phase um, in, in Nonfiction Book Academy, we have an entire, um, an entire module on market research. And one of the first things we have people do is look up all the competing books, all the books that are in the same market and look at them all as a whole. And one of the steps in there, we're looking for a lot of different things because we want your book to stand out in the market and be the one everyone talks about. Because mm -hmm. there's probably 200 mm -hmm. books in your market that are exactly the same and don't do anything. But if your book stands out, really you, you win, right? You win over everybody else. So um, what we do is we teach people to go to, go look at the negative reviews and write down everything they're complaining about. And then make and don't sure do that. Your book addresses all <laughs> of those negative things. Don't do that, right? right. Like right. if it's if it, if every single one of those fifteen reviews says that it's it reads like a sales letter, okay, there's a clue. Don't don't make it sound like a sales letter, <laughs> right? Or if it says, you know, yeah, this is great for so and so because she's a millionaire, but I could never do that as a poor person. Then then write in a specific story about how you do it. As a, as a poor person, I don't, I'm not speaking very well right now, but you know, like use those negative reviews on those other books to help make your book better. And you do the same thing with courses, same exact thing. Like go and check out all the other courses, look at the reviews, what are people saying? But also realize that negative reviews is a tactic. You know, I mean, it's, it's a tactic that other competitors will use against you. Amazon, it's kind of hard to do that nowadays. It used to be, you could just you know, you hire a higher link bait and all that kind of thing. Like you just, you just hire a link farm and, and they'll go in and write 15 bad reviews or whatever, but it's a little harder to do that on Amazon now. But I mean, the best thing to do is just write a really good book and get, get the people that, you know, loved it. Every time someone says, did you love this book? I love this book. You say, Hey, would you go put that on Amazon? Cause people don't think to put reviews on Amazon. In your book, say, did you love this book? Go give it an Amazon review. Like ask them right in the book. I've learned that you have to ask for the review, even though it feels uncomfortable and tuning your own horn or whatever, but you just got to ask and you got to do it regularly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the only thing you can do about bad reviews is push them down with more good reviews. And yeah. everyone is like, okay, whatever. It, it, there, if, if you only have good reviews and you don't have bad reviews, sometimes that goes against the trust as well, because it's like, oh, she got, you know, all her friends to buy, buy books and, and give good reviews. But if there's a couple of negatives or a couple of four or three stars, that helps actually add to the legitimacy of, of the book. We got another question um, from Jose. And I don't know if you want to save this for later when we talk about Nonfiction Book Academy, but he's just asking if you're going to talk about the cost of the whole process from start to finish of having a book published. I can do that. This <laughs> it's anywhere from, I mean, it the depends, right? Is, who knows? Like, how are you going to publish it? How many pages is it? What's the trim size? Is it hardcover or softcover? There's no way to, to exactly guess it, like to tell you exactly the, the price range could go anywhere from $2,000 to 200,000. If you have a really good ghostwriter, you know, like it, I don't know. That's really hard. You can get, if you do the writing yourself and you do the publishing yourself, you're actually going to probably hurt yourself more. Like going super cheap is going to hurt you in the long run because you will miss things that you don't know. Like you don't know that every time you see 9,000 on a barcode on the back of a book, or there is no barcode on the back of the book, that book cannot be scanned, which means you'll never get 
a rating because those every time some someone scans a book through a properly done barcode, that gets reported to Nielsen Book Scan, which keeps track of all the numbers for bestseller lists for everything else. So like depending on your goals, you need to have certain information in that barcode. You won't know that if you do it yourself. Most books, I, I'm, I make a game of it now. I'll go look at books and I'm like, oh, 9,000. They didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> 9,000. And I mean, even books that are, are done by, by um, hybrid publishers and publishers that should know what they're doing still have barcodes that aren't right. So, you know, little things like that or starting your, starting your chapters on the left-hand side of the page. Never do that. That immediately subconsciously triggers people to go, this isn't right. I don't know why this isn't right, but something's not right. And, and it, it lowers the trust. It lowers the professional quality of that book just because you started chapter two on the left-hand side of the page. And a poorly designed cover, isn't that like a huge- Poorly designed cover will kill you. Yeah. <laughs> it will just yeah. kill you because that's the first thing they're judging. They're judging the cover. They're judging the back cover, which is where your sales copy is. They're judging the table of contents, which is your best selling tool. Because if you use the table of contents correctly and you label it like, a, like it's a, a piece of sales copy, that'll make them buy right there if, it, if it's the right audience and the right person. So I love I don't it. Know if that I'll, answered the question. It, you're it not going to get it for free. Your yeah. self publishing does, is not free, <laughs> it, yeah. it will cost a few thousand dollars one way or the other, your best bet is to get guidance and help so that they can help you keep the costs as low as possible, but also make sure you don't miss anything and you don't hurt yourself in the process. Uh, one more quick question from Steven and then let's move on is, uh, is doing Kindle only, i.e. digital only a big disadvantage? Yes, absolutely. Mainly because well, people go, I just want to write an ebook. I, I want to write just an ebook. That, that phrase alone says, oh, it's not as valuable. Print books are where the value is. Audio books are where the money is. <laughs> and digital books are where the attraction factor is. So being able to offer a digital book for very cheap or free is, is a great way to attract people to you. Um, but you need to have a physical book, even if you don't have them printed already and they're only available on Amazon and it's print on demand and whatever. If you don't have it available as a print edition, people won't think it's a real book because everybody's it. When we've been in this digital world now, 20 years and people know it's, Oh, it's a free report. They're just calling it an ebook. You know, there's just not the perceived value there. So you really do want to have it available as a print book, which means in going back to the previous question, you have to have it formatted a certain way. You have to have it, you know, you have to have certain things in place. You're in nonfiction book Academy. I give you my Indian, uh, my, my lady in India who does this stuff. And <laughs> you know, it's, it's a couple hundred dollars. If you try to do it on your own, you're going to spend four weeks pulling your hair out and then you're going to end up hiring somebody anyway, because it's, it's, it's a nightmare process unless you're an expert. So, yeah. Cool. Well, All right. uh, Brevi, we'll get to your question in just a little bit. Let's go ahead and, and roll. Keep rolling. Here we go. All right. So why now? So right now we're in the middle of quarantine, right? I don't know when you're watching this, but we're, we're, there's a lot of time that's happening. I personally see a lot of people who are like, oh, you've got all this free time. I was like, well, not really, because most entrepreneurs and people who are in business are like redoubling their efforts. They're, they're working harder than they ever have before. I know I am. The problem is, is that most people who are in an entrepreneurship position in the digital world, which you are, most of those people, if they are redoubling their efforts, they are paying more on Facebook ads because they want more of that spend. They want more of, of that, uh, of, of that market share right now. They're spending more because they're competitors or they're pulling back and they're not spending anything and they're not doing anything and they're afraid to act. And they're just like, I don't want to offend anybody. So I'm just going to wait until this is all over. And then I'll start marketing again. If you're pulling back, you're like, you're out of the race done. Like, forget it. And you're not like that because you're here, you're listening to us. That's not you. But if you are, if you're putting a lot of money and effort and time into creating a crap ton of content and, and buying Facebook ads and doing all of this work on, um, on the short term, all you're doing is adding more flashes in the night. You're just adding quick little flashes in the pan. Even if it's a, even if it's a podcast that you started, like that takes time to build up, right? 
if, if it's um, guest blog posts that you're writing for people like, okay, that, but those are just flashes in the pan. It's not a beacon. You could be spending this time right now writing a book that's going to bring you clients and customers for the next 50 years. Like it could completely change your life. The next Facebook ad you do is not going to change your life. <laughs> You know, it might bring you a whole lot of money in the short term, but it's not going to change your life. So when I say why now, I want you to understand that now we have, we are in a unique situation time-wise people always say, Oh, I've got, I'll do it later. There's always more time to write my book and yeah, or you may never do it. <laughs> That's, you know, either way you, you may do it, you may not. But I want you to know that your audience, it's urgent for your audience. They're, we're always talking about urgency and scarcity in marketing circles. And I think so much of it is bullshit. It's just so much crap. Like, oh, put your countdown timer. Oh, there's only four left. It's a digital course. There's not four left. There's as many as I want. <laughs> it's like, it's not real. And people know that, right? The real urgency is the fact that you help parents teach their kids how to read and for God's sake, they're sitting at home and they need to, their kids need to read because they need them to be able to sit on the couch and read a book. Like you're solving real pain, right? You're teaching people how to invest properly so they don't lose their entire life savings and, and, you know, aren't able to, aren't able to live the way they want to live. You are helping keep people, um, away from, from drinking. That's another, one of our authors has an amazing book that helps people quit drinking. In her case, she's literally saving people's lives. Like she's she's helping parents stay together and, and keeping people from losing their kids. It is urgent for those people. When I first started my career, I read a book called The Well-Fed Writer by Peter Bowerman, which is all about freelance copywriting. I didn't know that existed. I didn't know it was a thing. And I would not be here talking to you today if it weren't for that book. And if he hadn't written that book when he did, I may never have found it. So how many people, how many students, how many customers might you have with a book? And if you put that book off even by six months or a year, how many people may never find you or have or have already gone and solved their problem somewhere else with a competitor? Like it's urgent because your audience needs you. Presumably you are the best choice for them you should believe that you are the best choice for them and that you are the one that's going to solve their problem, not a competitor. Therefore, you need them to pay attention to you and you need the credibility and the trust factors built in. And all of that happens with a book. What I know is <laughs> you're going to go away from this and you're going to try to write it on your own. You may watch a million YouTube videos that I've done or whatever but you've got to have accountability in place and you've got to have guidance because you're going to get stuck. Every single author, myself included, gets stuck in very predictable places. The, the benefit of having a guide of having a nonfiction book Academy or some other guide is being able to have someone go, okay, author freak out number three, here's how you fix it. Go finish it. Like just move on. This is what's going on. Here's how you fix it. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Relentless support, someone who believes in you, someone who's not going to let you give up on yourself. That's what you need to get this done. And that's what we do in the Academy. If you would love to join us, I'd love to have you because I genuinely love books and I genuinely love entrepreneurs. And I just, I, it's my honor to be able to help as many people as I possibly can. So that's, that's all I've got for you. <laughs> Is your brain all full now? <laughs> That, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, tell us more about talking people off the ledge. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, myself, like I, like I've tried and then I failed and I've written like really teeny short books. And I'm like, you know, I'm doing exactly what you're talking about right now. I'm focusing on disappearing content that like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm making stuff, doing stuff, but the social, it just scrolls down into the abyss of social media. Right. How do we, how do we pull back? Cause we definitely, I mean, a book, you have to put in like a lot of effort. There's no quick, I mean, there are quick wins along the way, but it's not a quick tactic. Right. 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 But and that's it, why, yeah, that's why people will sell you the quick tactics. They'll sell you the book in the box. They'll sell you, you know, write a book in a weekend, write a book in a, a day, write a book in an hour. I mean, it keeps getting <laughs> smaller. I'm like, for, at what point does this stop? 
yeah. it takes time. It doesn't have to take 90 days. It can, I mean, we've had people go through the Academy who finished in 22 days. Like I think that's our record, but wow. you, when you have the right structures in place, when you learn high level topics, question-based outline, point A, point B, all the things that we teach. And I mean, I, I actually designed this course to be work as you go. So the reason, the reason that people get stuck is because they learn this stuff and then they try to do it. I'm like, no, let's just do it as we go along. Like watch the video, do it, watch the video, do it. Like, and, and when we, we spend a, most of the teaching content is spent around book development, which is the early stages before you start writing. When you learned how to write in school, you learned step one, write an outline. Step two, write the draft. Step three, if you have time, go back and revise it. <laughs> but you probably won't because you're writing really fast. But they completely skip step zero. Step zero is book development. Step zero is what's your audience? What's your purpose? What's your goal? What are the high level topics that are gonna get people from point A to point B? What's the conversion point? What are the sales pieces that I need in place? Most importantly, how do I write my outline so that it pulls me forward? How do I write my outline so that it's using my brain and the way my brain naturally works in the real world? Do you want me to give it away? Let <laughs> me give away the secret for the people yeah. who actually stuck around for this long. Okay. Yeah. So like, this is, this will change your life. This will blow your mind. This is what we teach inside the Academy. This is one of the, one of the tactics we teach that has to do with your neurochemistry and how your brain works. Right. Your brain is hardwired to answer questions. It can't not answer a question. If I say, Chris, why should I have a, 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 um, an online course? Do you have any so trouble you, answering that question? Not at all. So you don't, no. you know, leave this earth with uh, untapped potential and not impacting just, people in a positive way. You rattle it off. You know yeah. the answer because you, you're an expert. You know, if I ask, hey, how does a beginner get started in Forex on the day one? What's the very first thing I need to do? You're not going to have a problem answering that question. But if I say the benefits of having an online course, which is how you would normally write an outline, you put bullet points with sentences with a period at the end or worse, just keywords like benefits, problems like that's hard. It gets stuck in your brain and you're like, oh, but there's so many benefits and there's which one is first. And oh my God, what if I forget one? And oh crap, that one should have gone number two, not number one. And I have to rearrange it. And they get stuck. Just those people will spend years writing an outline because of the way they were taught under the old rules, because they were taught that the format and the, the Roman numerals and the big A's and the little A's and all that stuff was more important than what actually the outline is supposed to do which is pull you forward and make the writing easy. So we, we help you make the writing easy by creating your entire outline in the form of a question, after question, after question, after question. So you can go 10 minutes at a time. You're picking up your kid from soccer. They're running late. Great. I can answer a question and, and move forward in my book. I don't have to go from page one to page 200. I can jump around. Oh, I'm really on a roll. And you know, I just talked to a client about the main problem with beginners in Forex and I, it's in my brain. So I'm just going to answer that question and write it down. You you've, you've worked on your book. Pretty cool. You can't not answer questions. So as long as you have everything in your outline developed properly and asking the right questions, you're never going to get stuck that way. You're going to get stuck on mindset issues. You're going to get stuck on emotional issues <laughs> because you're, you're on a journey. This is what other people don't realize is the person that you end up becoming when you publish your book is not the same person that started writing that book. It's not, you are going to transform on this journey to becoming an author because your book knows what it needs to be. And you have to become the person who is worthy of, of producing that book. Like everything has to line up and there's a journey that happens. So there's places you'll get stuck, but the writing won't be it. The writing will not be it. That is awesome. And uh, I have a bunch of questions for you, but I'm going to love on the tribe. Just one <laughs> quick, quick answer. One, how much of the process is outlining versus writing is like outlining like a third of it, a half of it, a 10th of it. Of, of what process? 
of just coming writing the book how much time how much is outlining of as a percentage so of the, the the book development process when i do it one on one with clients it's it's 2 to 3 hours and i just do it for them i'm like all right wow. tell me about your goal tell me about your audience tell me about what what their what's their point a their point b great i'm going to we do it together but i basically do it for them and it's a few hours when people go through the course and they do it on their own up to the up to the outline development part it can take anywhere from a few days to um, a week or so. I don't want it to go longer than a week because that means that there's something in their brain that's stuck and they're not, they're either not quite clear on their point A or point B, or maybe they're trying to um, talk about a topic that, that isn't really aligned with what their goal is. There's a lot of reasons and we have to figure out what that is. That's why we do coaching. But um, the outline, the process itself doesn't take a long time. And, and when you do that, the writing goes so much faster. Like I've written a book in a week. The way I developed a question-based outline was writing a book in a week because I had to for a client because he had something, you know, he had a radio show that he had to have the book ready for. So like, I didn't have a choice to get stuck. So I had to develop this whole system in order to get that book done. So, I mean, it's possible to do it really quickly but that's with, you know, 30 years of writing experience under my belt. So for well, you that's guys, the point of having a guide and a co somebody to help coach you through it who has these yeah. processes that you can lean on instead of like inventing process from scratch. It's exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I, I, my goal is for you to have your book because there's people out there in the world who really need it. It's not like an ego piece. Most people, you know, I'm going to write a book so that I can be a best-selling author. And it's a big, it's a big ego boost. And it's going to position me as the expert. I'm like, if you're an actual expert, your brain is focused on the people you're serving. And those are the people that I help. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Well, um, I'm going to move on to the questions because you got a bunch coming in. <clears throat> I have more questions for you, but to be continued. And by Thank the way, for you in the audience, if you want to come and talk live, feel free to click the raise your hand button there in Zoom. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing and so we can like be looking at each other. Is that good? That's awesome. Okay. Um, so Brevi, uh, if you want to talk live, raise your hand. If not, no worries. We can we can do it through the chat. But um, I, I'm going to take your questions a little bit out of order. Brevi, Brevi asks, uh, what happens once the book is finished on your platform or inside Nonfiction Book Academy? Do you assist in the publishing process? And by the way, just... If you're listening and you haven't clicked on the link yet, it's in the chat. You want to go to nonfictionbookacademy.com forward slash writing. So what, what answer do you have for Brevi about after finishing the book, do you help in the publishing? So the first thing we do, so we, there's a writing masterclass and there's a publishing masterclass. And so it's like two courses. Is yeah. So there's two courses. Um, but, but before you get to the publishing one, the first thing or the last thing we have you do in the writing masterclass is figure out the right publishing avenue for you because you're, you may be one of the 3% of people that I recommend you do go to a traditional publisher. Depends on your platform. It depends on your, your book topic, how good, you know, how it, it depends on a lot of things, but there are a tiny few reasons why you would want to be traditionally published. You may want to go with a hybrid publisher, which we have a publishing company that will do it for you. But we also have the other course where we can like literally walk you through screenshot by screenshot. This is how you do it yourself. But we want to make sure that you're doing it the right, you're going down the right path first so that you're not going to, you know, self-publish when you really could have killed it as a, as a traditionally published author. So we make sure that you're, you're on the right path for what you're doing. So are the, are the options like self-publishing and traditional publishing, or is there more than that? Or that's basically it. All right. So that that's basically it, but there's subtopics. Well, there's yeah. traditional publishing is all that. And, and, and traditional, the, the pros and cons of that are um, you get massive distribution. You do not get marketing. They are not going to market for you. They are going to take all of the control and yeah. they are going to take 90% of the profits. So there's, you got to really have a good reason to need that distribution to go that way. Also, people who, um, <laughs> some of our clients, including Russell, actually, with his most recent book, have had, they, they did the hybrid or the self-publishing, and then a, other bigger publishers are trying to, like, they poach. <laughs> They're like, oh, let us publish for you. Uh, we'll yeah. help you get into bookstores. Oh, let us give you this great big advance. And you're like, now, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where were you? So, so, 
So yeah. you can be self-published and then become traditionally published later. Um, and sometimes that's a good deal and sometimes it's not. Um, but under self-publishing, there's do it all yourself and hope you do the best you can and, and, and you just, you're doing it, right? There's indie publishing, which is you set up your own imprint, which means publishing name and you buy your own ISBN numbers. Or if you're in another country, they, some like Canada will give you one for free. Um, and you publish it as if you were a publishing company that just so happens to publish your books, which by the way is how Hay House started. Louise Hay could not get her book published, so she did it herself. And that's how Hay, now they're the biggest self-development publisher in the world. So just in case you feel like, oh, that's, you know, it's only publishing me, that's so weird. I'm like, well, it was good enough for Hay House. So <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, and, then, and then there's um, hybrid publishing, which is basically you're, you're splitting the profits differently they do the work, but they are taking a percentage of, of the book. Um, and you are paying upfront as like, usually it's five to $10,000 that you pay them for them to do the work. And then there's, there's a weird, there's a whole three page weird split on how, how all of that gets shaken out. I don't think that, um, hybrid publishing is really necessary unless you just gen genuinely don't have time and you really want it to be well done. That's, I mean, we are a hybrid publisher, Thanet House Books, we do that. We basically want to um, help you indie publish under your own imprint without having to do the work. So it's like, we're, we're the hired guns that come in and, and do all the work, but then you own it. You, you, all the money is set up to go to you. All, everything is, is set up in your name the way that you want it as if you self-published it really, really well. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, another question on what are the options to become a New York Times bestselling author only through traditional or indie? And maybe for those that don't know, like, I mean, what is the New York bestselling author list? How is that generated? Does it matter? Like, what is it? I hate diverse people's bubbles. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, here's the dirty little secret behind the New York Times. It is a curated list, which means they put whoever they want on there. So it has nothing to do with like democratized no. meritocracy. People think it's like there's one list of sales and whoever sells the most gets on the lists. That is not how it works. If mm -hmm. it's an Amazon bestseller, which if you go to any, any publisher where they're like, we're going to guarantee you bestseller status, all that is, is they have a really large mailing list and Amazon they have, they have thousands of bestseller categories and they change the, the bestseller every hour. So you have like tens of thousands of chances to become a bestseller and they, they know how to work the algorithm, right? So that's like, eh, whatever, who cares? <laughs> but with New York Times, with Wall Street Journal, with USA Today, USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestseller lists are a little more legit. New York Times, I know for a fact um, it was published, who was it? There was some recent presidential candidate, I think it was the last election, put out a book, sold more than enough copies to, um, to be on the list, but they were a Republican candidate and they didn't even, they didn't even make it. So they're like, well, what the heck? I think it was Rand Paul. Is that, was that one of them? I don't know. I'm not sure. Look it up, like Google it. And then <laughs> it used, and then, so I have a friend uh, who wrote a book called Chris Beat Cancer. Great book put out by Hay House. Fantastic. Um, Chris is a friend of mine and like, it's a really good book. And he worked really hard because he really wanted this bestselling, bestselling um, title with New York Times. And he was all excited and he busted his butt. And you know what they said? Sorry, you sold 50,000 copies in, in a week, which is insane. That's a huge number of copies but we're sorry, most of them were on Amazon, so we're not gonna count it. Like they have this weird invisible ratio of what they'll accept and what they won't and they want, you know, they want geographical diversity. They have all these weird rules. So you, nobody really knows. <laughs> it's like, if you make New York Times, kick ass, good job for you, you know? But if not, like don't, just serve your customers, get it out as much as you can. Russell Brunson has sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies of his books. He has made an intense amount of money from, from it. And he has served, he has made hundreds and hundreds of millionaires because yeah. of his book. That's what his focus is. Like, 
great. You know, his new books are being published by Hay House. I hope they go to New York Times, but there's no way to know. There's just no way to know. And it and it's really frustrating for those people who like that's their dream. So like adjust your dream. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 those are own list. <laughs> adjust your dream. Oh, the problem is that one of the, you, my personal guess on the whole thing is that it, it, the whole bestseller list thing was invented to promote traditional publishers because there was no one else but traditional publishers. There was no such thing as self publishing when that was invented. And so it was very straightforward. Well, now marketers know how to do this. They know how to game systems. They know how to work algorithms. They know how to sell books. They know how to put out a campaign where you pre-order the book and you get you know, certain bonuses. And then when it drops, they sell a certain number of books and they get on a list. Like they know how it works, but the traditional publishers have no fucking clue. <laughs> Sorry. <It's all> <laughs> they have no idea how to do that. And so they, they kind of get annoyed. Like, well, it, well, those are just marketers. And so they, you know, or those are business people and, and they shouldn't count, or I don't know what there is in their minds, but they don't know how to make it work. And therefore they don't want it to be a level playing field, which is really kind of sad, but it's like, whatever, just keep serving your people. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us up to speed on that. We have another question about um, what's inside nonfiction book Academy. Uh, the question is just about, are there templates? Do you provide templates? Yep. I'm not sure what kind of templates, but what, What's your we don't have a template for your book because yeah. your book is unique and we want it to stand out and we want it to be, you know, we want it to be that beacon in your whole industry. We want it to be better than all the other books in your industry, right? So I'm not going to give you a template because probably whatever industry you're in, half the books that are in there have already been written on a certain template that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> there's lots of templates out there. What, what we do have is a step-by-step -step way for you to develop your book, develop your publishing plan, develop how are you going to, to get this written so that it does stand out. We do market research um, and then we walk you through the book development process so that you have an outline. And then we say, write your book. But what we really do have is accountability and ways to keep you motivated because that's where everybody goes. Ah! <laughs> so we, we, have, um, we have a Facebook group where people can check in. We have um, weekly coaching calls where I'm on there or my um, managing editor is on and we will answer whatever questions you have. Um, we have a successful author dashboard, which actually lets you keep track of your word count. And it has little like motivating, you know, red to green. It, it tells you, you put, you put in a deadline of when you want it done. It will reverse calculate how many words a day you have to write to get to that. Like there's all these things that will help motivate you to keep moving forward. Um, that's, I think the most valuable part. We also have, um, we have a manuscript template that includes everything that needs to go into a manuscript before you publish it. So there's front matter, there's back matter. There's well, how do you write a copyright page? All those kinds of things are all in there. Um, I don't know this. If you go to the website, there's a whole list of everything that's in there. We have a black book of every contractor and every piece of software that we use at Thanet House Books. So, you know, if you want to use the same designer that we use for for all of our covers, her name is in there and how to contact her. So we have all of our resources that we share with people and we're happy to provide introductions for that as well. So there's a lot in there. Amazing. Um, we got some more questions, uh, Stephen and Douglas coming in. Um, Stephen asks, he, he basically wrote a book in 2011. Should he do a second edition or just start over and write a new book? Start a new, start a new book. Why? Second, um, a second edition is technically 10% or less of different content. Like you don't, you're going to get more bang for your buck from writing a new book, even if it's similar stuff, you could do both. You could write a second edition of the same topic and then write something else. Um, but, but the beautiful thing is if you sold a lot of copy, like was the first book successful? Did it sell or did it, did it do what you wanted it to do? Cause not, I mean, if you gave it away, it didn't sell, but, um, the people who purchased your first book or who read your first book will buy the second one. It's a continuum, right? So then you have a bigger reach for your ripple effect. If you just, we're actually doing this for Christy right now. She's like, well, we could do an updated second edition. I'm like, let's write a second book because everybody who bought the first book is going to buy the second one. Oh, and there will be all these new people who buy the first one or the second one. We'll go back and buy the first one. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's you know, good point. it's just another, it's another stream. Um, Douglas asks, what is the appropriate length of a book that will serve the purpose that people will read it and then want to go buy like an online course or access to a training based membership site? And he's just saying that, I'm not sure if he heard it here, or just th thought of it that 50 pages seems a bit short. Like, I mean, people yeah. ask me, how long should my course be? I'm like, it depends. But like, what do you I don't know? <laughs> What's your topic? Who's your audience? What's the purpose? What's your goal? No, um, that yes. Yes. And um, the, the average nonfiction book is about 200 pages which is about 50,000 words. We shoot, when we're writing, when we're ghostwriting books for our clients, we, we shoot for between 45 at the really low end to 65 at the high end, a thousand words. Um, and if you divide that word count by 250, that'll give you roughly what your page count's gonna be, unless you have a lot of pictures. But, but that really depends on the trim size, meaning how big is the book? Is it a big book? Is it a little book? You know, that's going to change the pages. How much white space is there? That's going to change how fat it is. You know, is there a lot of pictures? Are there a lot of diagrams? The size of the book should be enough that it feels valuable. I, I, will, I bought a book on Amazon that I, I can't remember the topic, but I really wanted to learn. I was like, I got to know this. I got to know this stuff. Like the guy who wrote the sales copy was really good. And I'm like, I got to buy this. It got there and it was like a 50 page little paper. I was like, oh, seriously, are you, are you serious? <laughs> it didn't feel valuable. So, so that's the kind of thing where you want to choose your trim size appropriately. Choose, you know, make sure that it's got a lot of white space, but not too much white space. You know, there's like, there's a lot of things to consider but a hundred pages is, is about as low as you want to go on a normal size, eight and a half by five and a half book with mostly text. That's a standard businessy type book. Like that's about as close to an estimate as I can give you, <laughs> but I've got, I mean, I know people who've written brilliant books. Simon Sinek is, is a very famous author. People love his books. He wrote Start With Why and a bunch of other really dense, heavy business books that are very, for he also wrote a comic book, like a, like a little hardback, it's called, it's called Better Together. It's a great book. It's a, it's a parable and it's all pictures. It's like a comic, not a comic book like you read with lots of panels, but it's like a children's book. But it sells for $28 at Barnes and Noble and I bought four copies. Like it's a brilliant book and it's tiny. So the Go-Giver is another great example. If you've ever read The Go-Giver, it's a tiny little parable book, but it sells like crazy. And it, and it keeps that, it keeps Bob Berg and my friend, John in, 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 you know, doing really well. <laughs> like they get plenty of, of work and plenty of clients from those books. So it, it really does depend a lot. Who moved my cheese? That's another Who one. Moved I see. My cheese? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's little, it's tiny. It's, and, and the funny part is, is they had to beef that up by adding a, a beginning that explains the book. And then they do the little tiny story. And then they have all this discussion stuff at the end, because it's like, we can't sell this book when it's that thin. There's only 10 pages. So, yeah. I think you got Deborah concerned. She's asking, can self-publishers get an ISBN that doesn't start with nine? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> it, so the nine thing is a barcode, not an ISBN. Yeah. But the ISBN needs to go into the barcode. It has to be labeled. So we we show you um, software that will generate that. Like we give you, we can give you those. That's that's barcode is not an issue. You do buy your own. And this is the difference between self-published and indie published. Self-publishers go to Amazon and Amazon says, hey, let us give you an ISBN for free. We're so happy that you're on our platform. Let us give this to you. Technically, that means Amazon published it. They're not going to tell you that, right? That's their ISBN. So if you're in the United States, you go to a, a website called bowker.com and you buy an I, you buy a block of ISBNs. They're like really expensive for one. We tell people to buy 10 because if you have an ebook and a print book, you need two. If you have an audiobook, you need three. If you have a workbook, you need four. Every format has to have its own ISBN. So um, if you're in Canada, you go to whatever website gives away those they give them away for free germany gives them away for free i think every country has their own way of distributing them they're not super expensive if you buy one it's like 125 dollars. but if you buy 10 it's like 225 or something it's it goes down exponentially we buy them in batches of um of a thousand or no 500 
because it's like five bucks each. So what's the spelling on Balor or Bowker B O W K E R. But the actual website is my identifiers.com. And that's wow. only for us people. That is awesome. Um, Revy's looking, uh, if you ever consider hiring ghostwriters or editors, I encourage you to reach out to Julie on her website, but, yep. um, I have a couple more questions for you. And, okay. uh, before I get in, I like talking about <laughs> before, before I get into those and we'll just a few more questions and then we'll wrap up and draw the winner of the, the giveaway. Um, uh, go to nonfunctionbookacademy.com book forward slash writing. Go check out what Julie's up to with her program. There's two parts, uh, the writing and the publishing, right? Yeah, the publishing isn't quite ready yet because we're completely redoing it. Remember when I said, you know, that lady who wrote the Facebook book nine yeah. times? So we're doing that with publishing because we want to make sure that all the new, like Create Space was the way that you got on Amazon the last time I did this course, this now we have to update it because create space doesn't exist anymore. And KDP is the only way to publish on Amazon. And there's, there's just always new things. So we're redoing it, but that'll be open. The, the publishing part will be open in the next month or so. That's awesome. And uh, just for, for my own benefit, because uh, if you haven't listened to our podcast episode I did with Julie, like I said, I believe it's going live today. Um, go check out LMS cast. But and when you get into outlining, I wanted to ask you, how do we, the question based thing totally makes sense. And just whenever you do it, the exercise, <laughs> it just feels like 10 times easier. Uh, my there's a follow on question, which is how do we increase the quality of the questions we ask to build the best outline? Really good question. So remember point A and point B. Yeah. So the first step before you do the questions is you brainstorm all of the major topics that are going to get people from point A to point B. Okay. The way that you educate, you inspire with stories, you educate with frameworks. So you have to have certain frameworks in place and whatever you teach, if you teach, you have frameworks, you, you have a way that you do it. So you have, you know, the six step system or you have the five pillars or whatever. Um, those are what go in the, the high level, the chapter level heading, right? And then underneath that, you're asking questions. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was writing my book, The Profitable Business Author, I needed an example. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to make something up. Um, let's pretend that we are we own a dog spa and we are dog groomers. And like, I, it was so funny because I don't have a dog. I don't even really like dogs. I'm a cat person, you know, like I have never been to a groomer in my life, but I wrote an outline using this process that people literally were emailing me, asking me where they could buy the book. I'm like, it's not real. I told you I made it up. <laughs> like, it's not a real book. But what we did was, so I went through, okay, what, what would I ask? Yeah. What would my target audience, if I put myself in that place, what would they want to know about starting a dog grooming business? I would want to know, where do you learn how to dog groom? So that's education. And I would want to know about location and I would want to know about business licenses. And I would, you know, so I have these major topics, but then it's like, okay, location. What do I want to know about location? That's where you start asking the question. So why is good location important? What makes a good location? What if I live in the, in the rural, in rural communities? Um, how do I get people to come to my location? How do I advertise at my location? Like, you know, you're, you're breaking the questions down underneath the chapter heading. What I like to give people a rule of thumb, I say, if it takes you more than 10 minutes to answer the question, you probably need to break it into more questions because it's too big. So like, if you say, you know, what's the socioeconomic implications of the French revolution? Like that's a really big topic. You have to break it down into smaller questions. So make sure that your questions are small enough and make sure that they're simple enough. Remember your audience doesn't know what you know. You are the guide, you are the Yoda and they need to know the stuff that you, th that you just don't even, they're like, everybody knows that. Everybody knows how to write an outline, right? Like, no, they don't. So I have to, to, to walk people through this. So Remember, you're the expert and you need to ask simpler questions than you think you do. You don't need to prove how smart you are. You need to help them understand how they can do this. 
they know you're smart. You're an author. <laughs> like it's just a given, right? But if it's too, if you if you talk at too high of a level and your, your questions are too complex, then people they just they just they can't finish it. They can't read it. The other, but it's, unless your target audience is advanced, if your target audience is advanced, then you want to ask advanced questions and you want to make sure. Okay, is this too simple? So one of the steps in the process of writing is getting beta readers. And there's a very specific process around which people you want to read your book first and what you want them to tell you so that you get that information. Like, is this too high level or is it too low level? Wow. You got to have I, the right person reading that because mom won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that never gets old watching you get into the questioning things. It's like your ninja <laughs> move. My last question for you today is if, you're watching this live with us now, or you're watching this on YouTube or on the webinar replay at some point in the future. What's the forcing function or what's the, um, if somebody has been on the fence or they've been like me and they've been trying to write a book for like a decade or five years, two years, whatever it is. Um, what do you have to say to that person? And then if they're ready to move forward, what should they do? So don't think about, the writing part or the publishing part or the distribution part or all the hard parts. All you have to decide is, are you gonna be an author or not? Are you going to help people with a book? Are you going to build a beacon for your business that's gonna last way beyond all these little flashes in the night or not? If you're not, that's totally fine. Go do something else, but stop obsessing over being, being an author. Don't say I'm gonna be an author someday because we don't know how much time we have, right? And the people who need you right now, need you right now. <laughs> there's not, there's no time, okay? And if you decide, I want to be an author, I want to finally get this book out of me, then you need a guide who will help you do that, who will help you get it out. Because if you've been trying to do it for 10 years, Russell was trying, he's a great writer. He'd been trying to write a book for nine years. He already had a publishing contract, nine years old. He's like, Julie, I can't do this. I got, I need you. So, so just jump in the pool. Stop thinking about how cold it is. Just jump in and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit to doing it. Now is the most amazing time because we have all this time on our hands and come in and just let me help you. I will guide you and I will not let you fall. I will not let you sink and I will not let you not do it unless you simply don't engage. Like, it's like when a parent is teaching their kid how to dive and it's like, come on, just jump, just jump. I'll catch you. I promise <laughs> you might get wet. Your head might go under a little bit, but, but it's okay. I will not let you drown. You're going to, you're going to make it out the other side as an author, as long as you really put yourself into it. So, you know, if it's time and your people need you, then, then let's go chop, chop. <laughs> That's awesome. So go to nonfictionbookacademy.com forward slash writing. Um, there's a link to that either in this chat or below this video, wherever you're watching it later. Um, Julie, I want to thank you for coming. This has been amazing. Real quick, uh, we just pulled our giveaway winner. So Stephen Margison is the winner of the free Yay, of, <laughs> of one of our $99 Lifter LMS add-ons. Just send an email to team at lifterlms.com and we'll hook you up. Julie, I'm really grateful for this episode this is or this this webinar this is so good um if you like what you saw here go to nonfictionbookacademy.com forward slash writing also check out the uh podcast we did with julie um th th that is going live just right around this time so go check that out and julie thanks so much for coming in front of the course building community this has been amazing you're so and, welcome. Uh, and thank you all for, for hanging in there. And I know, gosh, we've been going two hours. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. We did the podcast. I'm like the hours up. I'm like, I can't yeah. No, We got two. This is awesome. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> this is and awesome. I'm happy to answer questions. Go to, you know, there's, there's uh, emails on the website. You can find me. Like if you have a question or whatever, just, just email me and I'm happy to happy to answer that. Awesome. Julie Eason at Nonfiction Book Academy. Thank you all for coming. Kathy, thanks for helping put this on. And I hope everybody has an amazing rest of your day. Bye.